Welcome. We're glad you could join us for online worship here at First United Methodist Church of Glendale, a time to renew and enliven our faith and offer our praises for God's blessings. Larry Del Rey is our liturgist and music leader. Judy Polhouse is our accompanist, and Christine Jones is operating our video sound and recording, assisted by Reverend Tom Wick. I'm Pastor Tom Jelinek, self-isolating today, and as we begin our service, I invite Larry and Judy to lead us in our opening hymn. I hope you're all having a good day today. Our musical opening for today's service is Maker in Whom We Live. And it, the words are by Charles Wesley. And 120 years after he penned the words, George Elvey set it to music. So please join us together. And now, let us pause for a time of prayer together. Wise and patient God, you have given us multiple blessings and ask that we develop these gifts and use them to help others. We sometimes think of our gifts, our talents, as things that are less than worthy. Help us to remember that you have given gifts which can be used to help others. Each gift and talent is precious in your sight. Help us use the gifts we have to share your love and to give each other with joy. One of the greatest gifts you have given us is the gift of prayer. We bring before you the concerns which have been weighing on our hearts, and we lift up to you in praise the blessings and situations which bring us joy. We offer our prayers of praise and intercession to you at this time.
God of healing and grace, touch the lives of all the people and situations we have named before you. We ask that you pour out upon them your healing love. Give each one a sense of your powerful presence. Flood their lives and ours with hope and peace. And help each of us to work for you, trusting in your abiding presence and love for us and challenging us to use our gifts and to honor the giver. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and as he taught us, so now we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For those of you who may not recognize me, I am Christine Jones. I normally sit in the balcony or in the corner with the audio equipment, with the streaming software, with the camera, to make sure that the video gets onto the website. I spend a good portion of each weekend editing and uploading videos. This may sound like something that is time consuming, and it is. It may sound like something that's difficult or challenging, and I think I've gotten better over the last eight months. I've spent a lot of time training with the United Methodist Communications Program to learn about the best practices in making sure that the message gets to you. I know that this is all behind the scenes and only my husband really gets to see how much time and effort is put into it. Although, Pastor Tom Wick has taken the load whenever I'm not available. It is a lot. It's hours of work. And now I sound like I'm complaining, but I'm not. I want to share with you something before I come back to why I've done this and will continue to do the work behind the scenes. I'm a fan of the United Methodist Discipleship Series known as Chuck Knows Church. About two years ago, they, the United Methodist Discipleship Ministries, put out a series called The Committee. When I was asked to talk about stewardship, I immediately thought about the episode of the committee where they discuss the whole of stewardship. They start with the biblical principle of tithing. God gives unto us, and we give back one-tenth of everything God has blessed us with. Then they get into a heavy discussion. Stewardship isn't about how the church pays its bills. We don't tithe out of obligation or duty. Being stewards is more than an obligation to give to the church budget. Tithing isn't the end-all, be-all of stewardship. People sometimes say that the church is always talking about money or that the topic is avoided completely, and I tend to fall in that later category. It's dangerous when a church focuses too much on the budget because being stewards is not about the budget. Being stewards is about our gratitude towards God. It's about hope and compassion, about the community, about the joyful side of giving, things that drive generosity. It's about teaching people the joy of living as generous disciples. In the episode of the committee, they discuss the story of the rich man. This parable appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He was faithful tithing, following all of the commandments, giving to the temple. And Jesus told him he was lacking one thing, told him to sell all of his things, give it to the poor and follow him. And you will have treasures in heaven. And what did he do? He couldn't do it. The problem wasn't giving the money to the temple because he had plenty of it. It was more about the wealth he wanted to hold on to. His money had a stranglehold on him, and he couldn't let go of it. In fact, Jesus spoke a lot about money. 
It was always about how we can use it as faithful stewards, how it can bring us joy in our generosity, but how it can also be a barrier to joy by loving money too much, like the rich man did. When the discussion turned back to conversation, Chuck of the committee did something that he does in every episode of the series. He brought the conversation around to an understanding of relationships. At its heart, stewardship is about relationships. The relationship with the church, the relationship with the community around the church, our relationship with that greater community here in the state and around the world. But most of all, it's about our relationship with God. That is the key, understanding how stewardship relates to our relationship with Christ how we live out God's message in the world. It's less about paying the bills and more about discipleship. It's really about helping people lead generous lives. People like you and me. In a thoughtful aside, the characters talk about the tithe. It's not so much about giving 10% 10 of your income or 5% or even 2%. It's about what we do with the other 90, 95, or 98%. It's not about giving until it hurts. It's about giving until it feels good. It's kind of like Christmas morning. Not about the gifts you've been given, but the gifts you give. And imagine if we could feel that joy throughout the year. Paying for two kids in college and my husband and I finally securing stable, long-term jobs this August, I've not always been a joyful giver when it comes to money. In fact, this is the first year where I feel like I can give what I want to, the way that I want to, where I can actually be joyful in my gifts. I started out feeling guilty, not having a secure job, unsure about the future, and feeling the weight of those who depend upon me. But I still found ways to give. I gave what I could when I could, usually right around this time of year in a one lump sum. That's what I had. But I also gave in different ways. I updated the website, the Facebook page, the Instagram and Twitter accounts. I joined the audio visual team and started working with Pastor Tom Wick. Towards planning for the day, we will be able to live stream the message. Every week, I spend several hours filming, running sound, editing, and uploading God's message as presented by Reverend Tom Jelinek. I have and will continue to work behind the scenes because these are things I can do with the absolute joy of giving. Knowing that you are there, that you're watching and you're praying with us, that's part of what makes it a joy. So I got my letter in the mail and my commitment card. And this will be the first year I filled out a commitment card. And I will continue to give of my talents as God has given them to me. I know that doing so will bring me closer to God and help to build disciples for Christ. And I hope you'll join me in filling out those commitment cards this year. Pray with me. God, be with us as we go out to do your work. Help guide us to be good stewards of your church. Help us to find the joy of generous giving, whatever form that takes. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, our scripture reading is from the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one he who had received the five talents went off at once 
and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went out and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over the, me the five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been entrusted trust." You have been trustworthy in a few ways. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few ways. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who has received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not gather seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid the talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And now please join in singing Sanctuary. There was a young man coming out of a church one day who attended services infrequently. And the pastor was standing at the door of the church, as he always did, to shake hands after the service. He grabbed the young man by the hand and pulled him aside. The pastor said to him, young man, we need to see you more often. You need to join the army of the Lord. The young man replied, well, I'm already in the army of the Lord, pastor. And the pastor responded, then how come I don't see you except at Christmas and at Easter? 
the young man looked around, then whispered to the pastor, well, Pastor, I'm in the secret service. When we hear the word talent today, we think of a special ability or gift that someone has. We think especially of an ability in the field of artistic expression, such as art, literature, music, or acting. Or of, but, of, but the phrase could apply just as easily to math, science, teaching, cooking, parenting, or virtually any field or skill. The first definition of the term in Webster's Dictionary reads, a mental or physical aptitude, natural or acquired ability. However, in biblical times, a talent was a unit of currency and was a vast sum of money, nothing to sneeze at or even for someone comparatively wealthy to belittle. It's fairly easy to see how the ancient meaning of the word talent, a formidable treasure, evolved into the current meaning of a special ability or skill. Clearly, both riches and abilities are a great blessing to those who have them, and both can be a great blessing when they're used both to the benefit of those possessing them and to the enrichment of the community around them. I think most of us know someone, either in our families or in our circle of acquaintances, who exemplifies a truly talented person. One that comes to mind was a young man I met while a music student at the University of Arizona. I was one who had to really hit the books and the practice rooms hard for music theory and training, and I was always a little in awe of some of the other students, some much younger than I was, who could breeze through those hurdles. But one fellow student in particular was amazing. Jim was a pianist, equally fluent in both classical and popular music, jazz, virtually any style, and at 18 could play virtually any tune any of us in our dorm could think of on the spot and play it well. He also played the trumpet, guitar, and sang with perfection and seemed to be light years ahead of most of us in music theory. All of us in the School of Music who knew him had no doubt that if any of us had a chance of having a successful career in music, it was him. So I didn't surprise me when I heard some years later that Jim had moved to California after his time at the music school and had worked on a number of studio sessions for popular recordings and film soundtracks. The last I heard, Jim had written a good portion of the film score for a recent Disney movie. Most who knew him could see that Jim was truly talented. He had a very real gift and used it to the greatest extent of his ability, both for his own benefit and for those around him. Our scripture passage comes from a collection of teachings and parables found in chapters 24 and 25 of the Gospel of Matthew. Many biblical scholars classify these passages as the last of Jesus' great discourses in this gospel, the final group of teachings that Jesus shared with his disciples. This morning's parable is one of these in this discourse, all of which concern how the disciples should act in a responsible way during the time between when Jesus went to be with God 
and his return. The parable of the talents appears in both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, and also in an early apocryphal collection of Jesus' sayings, the Gospel of Thomas. And as such, this parable was probably well known in several early Christian communities. As we noted a few minutes ago, in biblical times, a talent was a large amount of currency. It consisted of over 96 pounds of silver. The sum of its worth was more than 15 years wages of a laborer. To look at it another way, the person who was given five talents would have had to have animals, carts, or some way to carry almost 500 pounds of silver home. When those who had been given this sizable wealth did what did with their resources is the focus of this parable. Those who were given several talents each traded with them. In other words, used the resources they had to give for various types of transactions and wound up with twice as much wealth as they started out with. The implication is that they shared these resources, spread them around, and took risks by using their wealth in a public way. And in doing this, they benefited by letting the wealth entrusted to them be used and benefit those they traded with. On the other hand, the person given one talent was concerned that something would happen to him if his, if his gift was somehow diminished. So he decided that that talent must be protected. He did it in a place where no one would see it and no loss or harm could come to it. The result of this decision, in contrast to the other two, was shame and punishment as the person given the resources had not used them for the benefit of others or for the benefit of the person who entrusted those resources to him. The moral of the story was and is that those who used what they had been given, putting their resources to work in the world around them, even at some risk, were rewarded with a great increase in their blessings, and those who kept their talents hidden suffered in the end because they hadn't used them. They had been they hadn't used the resources that they had been given in sharing with others and in helping others to benefit from those resources. The good news is that we are all truly talented. We possess gifts which, which are for our which are for ours to enjoy, share, and increase for the blessings for ourselves and those around us. Even the act of our presence in this community is a blessing to us all. There are innumerable talents that we see in evidence in this church and in this community even during this time of separation and isolation. And not a week goes by that at least one and often many of our First Church family bring their gifts and abilities to serve in the day-to-day, week-to-week life of this congregation. Our talents are a blessing to this family of Christ, this part of Christ's body here in this place and this time. Please pray with me. Gracious God, 
who bestows the talents we and those around us possess, we give you thanks. For all our gifts, all that you have given to us, we seek not only, we seek not to bury them or to put them away, but to use them in a way that shares blessings with as many people as possible. In sharing our gifts, we increase our blessing. And as we seek your direction, we may discover gifts and talents which we never knew we possessed. In gratitude, we give you thanks for the talents we and those around us possess and share our thanks in ways that we share them with others. Thanks be to God. And all of God's truly talented people said, Amen. And now, once again, we come to a time when we share our tithes, gifts, and offerings with our church family. We never cease to give thanks here at First United Methodist Church of Glendale for the faithful support that our church family offers to this congregation in its ministries. And we understand that during this season of the pandemic, that there are many challenges to our financial situations. And we never cease to give thanks for the way in which we continue to be able to offer the ministries that we have, both here in our congregation and community and to those ministries supported by our denomination. On your screen, you will see several different ways in which we can be a part of the ministries of this church family as we share our resources. And as we do so, let us pray this morning as we share our gifts with this family. Gracious God, there are no limits to the gifts you have given us. Now we return thanks to you for these gifts, and we bring these tokens to you, asking for your blessing on the givers and the gifts. Help these gifts and givers to be your witnesses throughout this congregation, this community, and throughout the world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Several days ago, we celebrated a national holiday to acknowledge the many contributions and sacrifices that our veterans have given our nation, even up to the ultimate sacrifice. The service of our veterans has made it possible for our nation to preserve the freedoms that are a part of our daily lives. In honor of our veterans, please join Larry and Judy in our closing hymn, America the Beautiful. Good. <laughs> 
beautiful for he was proof in liberating strife who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life america america may god thy gold refrain till all success be noblest and every gain divine oh beautiful for patriot dream that seems beyond the years thine alabaster thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in the law. And now go forth in peace, and may the love of God, the fellowship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all sharing our gifts now and forevermore go in peace amen Okay, we're going to start that one over. Sorry. <laughs>